It's time for us to begin this morning. We still have people coming in, but we want to go ahead and get started so we can give our speaker uh, all the time that he needs. In our worship this morning, of course, we'll be led in psalm by John Podine. Our opening prayer will be by Todd Brenneman. And our closing prayer will be led by Mike Jones, who preaches at the Evergreen Congregation. Let's all join together. All right, let's go ahead and stand up here while everybody's walking in here. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. And so shall I be saved from mine enemy. You know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Halted, I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. In Jesus Christ, he died for me, and he took away my sin, and I will live with him for eternity. You know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Halted, I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. You know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Halted, I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. And I will call upon the Lord. And I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. For heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer. For I'm in the glory land way. And onward I go rejoicing in his love. And I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer for I'm in the glory land way. And light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you. Oh, So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to King of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, and all for our sake became poor. So here I am to worship. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. And beauty 
that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. All right, if y'all would be seated here. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear! The be praying. Father in heaven, we're in awe of your grace. And amazing doesn't seem to justify and doesn't seem to completely encapsulate how phenomenal your grace is towards us. Father, help us to be grateful for all the blessings you provide for us. Help us to recognize those things that you do in our lives so that we might give you the glory. Father, we pray that the worship we offer to you is acceptable and pleasing to you. We pray, Father, that it comes from hearts that want to serve, from hearts that want to glorify you. This time, Father, especially, we ask that you be with Jordan Alexander. We pray, Father, for healing in that situation. We know that there's a long road ahead for him. We pray, Father, that you would be with those that are treating him and that they would make the right decisions uh, regarding his care for his speedy and as painless of a recovery as possible. We ask that you be with those and comfort those that are suffering with him, his parents, his family, his friends, and his teammates. And we pray, Father, that they would uh, be able not only to comfort uh, Jordan, but to be comforted themselves. We pray, Father, that in light of this tragedy, we draw together as a community, as the investigation goes into what happened and why this happened, that uh, wisdom would be offered so that uh, things like this would not happen again. We pray, Father, that as a community uh, here at Faulkner that we would continue to shine 
a light, uh, not only here in Montgomery, but in the world around us, that we might show our good works and people would glorify you. We pray, Father, now for the, uh, the speaker. We pray, Father, that you would speak through him, that you would give him wisdom and recollection of those things that would um, best uh, share your gospel, not only with us, but with those around us that need to hear of the wonderful gift of your son. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I think I can safely say that our speaker has come the longest distance of any that we've ever had at the lectureship at Faulkner. Wissam al Athawi. As I told you before, say that name three times fast and it gets interesting. This is the first time I've ever met Wissam in person. And when I met him, I said, You ain't from around here, are you? <laughs> he said, No, I'm not. He has a fascinating story to tell. We've already seen a brief video this past week in chapel about his story. And he has not only a fascinating personal story to tell, he has the most important inspired story to tell, which is, of course, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So at this time, for the Wissam al -Athawi. Appreciate that, brother. Thank you. Good morning. It is my honor to be invited to be a part of Faulkner University's lectureship. I cannot but, but get emotional. As I remember, a time in June, I think, of 2011, I had been in the United States for two months at that time. Just to put things into perspective, I have already applied for my citizenship now. And I was being interviewed for my asylum application. When I came, I applied for asylum for, uh, because of my religious conversion out of Islam back in Baghdad. And I will be talking more about that in detail, Lord willing, this evening at 7 p.m. And uh, our class is, uh, or God is near. So I visited a family in New Jersey, a, an Armenian family. Uh, the, the father of that family was born and raised in Baghdad. I was staying with that family to go and be interviewed for my asylum application when I went on a morning walk with one of his sons. And an older man met us in the park, and he knew that I've been in the United States for less than two months. He said, go to school. Go get a degree, because without a degree, you're nothing. Of course, I don't totally agree with what that man said, but I looked at him and said, I I'm an immigrant, I'm a refugee. My money are barely enough for me to, to go by the day and for my food and my basic needs. He said, borrow money and go to college. And I was looking at that man, what is he talking about? Doesn't he look how poor I am? Well, fast forward a few years later, I'm standing from behind the podium of an esteemed university in the United States giving a lecture. There is no one but God that I can give the credit for his work in my life as a version of his work in everybody else's lives. If we just stand back and just look at what God has been doing. To his glory first. And as long as you are in tune with God's will, blessings would be raining on you from sources that you don't know of. For this morning's class, I think I've been asked to... Sorry. Yes. Well, okay. We, uh, I have been asked to give a class on Is God One? Uh, because of my background and the work that I'm doing, I will be uh, uh, sharing more about that in, in detail. Uh, because I am familiar with both uh, faiths, Islam, and Christianity, that's usually what I do. I tell Muslims about Christ. That's what I do in Dearborn, Michigan. That has the biggest concentration of Middle Easterners anywhere outside the Middle East. And I tell Christians about Islam, like I will uh, tell you now. And so I will try to stick to my theme of my work, the work that I'm doing, and stick to the theme of this lectureship, which is about uh, God is. Uh, usually the problem with, with the majority of people uh, is uh, not whether there is one or more than one God. I mean, if you're a Christian, you, you should take for granted the fact that God is one. 
Even though the obscure doctrine of the Trinity is, is all over the Bible, you, you cannot just, uh, you, 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 you cannot but uh, uh, claim that God uh, and, and make the confession uh, that God is one as part of your Christian faith. The same thing goes with Muslims. And yet both Muslims and Christians have been fueling the debate on whether they are worshiping the same God or not. And the answer is neither yes nor no. That's why I have a full class on that this morning. <laughs> and this class is called, by the way, this is the Arab Christian ministry, the work that I'm doing, al khidma al arabiya al masihiyya The class for this morning is about the element of the Islamic faith, is Allah God. The point behind the Arab Christian ministry is to save Muslim souls, to show them the love of Christ first and then the truth of his gospel. Yes. And at the same time to educate the Christian community about Islam so that your family members would have an answer whenever they learn about Islam and whenever somebody says, I, I think I need to join the Islamic faith. You should have an answer to, okay, why don't you think that Islam is the way to God as it claims? Or why don't you think that Islam is a good faith to, to follow? Good and true are two uh, different uh, uh, attributes that Islam enjoys neither of them. Islam claims to be from God but fails to prove it. That makes it false. Uh, Islam, and I know this is a controversial subject, uh, is uh, eventually a militant faith. And I don't want to use this claim to promote hatred against your Muslim neighbor wh who is not accountable to what Muhammad said or did or what the Quran says. But Islam does not introduce itself as a, a, a good religion. And so to get to the point of preaching the gospel to your Muslim neighbor, you should know where your Muslim neighbor stands. And this is part of showing where your Muslim neighbor stands. You don't get to go to your Muslim neighbor and say, I am preaching a new God to you, my Muslim neighbor. What do you think of God? The Muslim would say, I think God is the creator of the universe, okay? He created the heavens and the earth in six days. The Quran says so, okay? He created Adam and Eve, created Adam out of dirt, created Eve out of Adam's rib. The Quran says that, okay? He appeared to Moses in the burning bush. The Quran says that, okay? Well, congratulations, you've been worshiping the wrong God. I'm introducing a new God. Please don't do that. The Quran may fail to describe the one God, the true way, but that does not mean that there is a totally different being by the name Allah next to God. Probably they don't even know of each other, and that's what actually many people think. Or some people think that, would, that uh, Muslims are uh, worshiping an idol or Satan. Or if, if the debate gets political and gets heated, obscenities will come out of... Uh, like to describe the Islamic God. And so let's study facts. Is Allah God or not? Uh, before I talk about that, I usually give classes about the history of Islam that enables you to know the theology of Islam. Where did the elements of the Islamic faith come from? Uh, that's why the study of history is important. All of that is available in my book, Islam in Christ's Eyes, a scriptural study on the origins of Islam and the Christian response available at Faulkner University now. So, I feel so bad promoting my own. I'm so, I mean, yeah. We are friends here. I mean, okay, good, thank you, thank you. I'm not embarrassed or anything. The elements of the Islamic faith existed before Muhammad. There is a part of the Islamic history way before Muhammad was born. In fact, Jesus Christ himself challenged what Muslims believe about uh, God and about the divinity of Christ in his own life on this earth. Jesus said in Matthew 22, I think it's verse 42, asking the Pharisees, what do you think of the Christ? Whose son is he? They said, he's the son of David. He said, then why does David call him Lord, saying in the spirit, quoting Psalm 110, the Lord has said to my Lord, sit at my right hand that I make your enemies your footstool. Traditionally, Jews believe that the Messiah, whoever he is, whether he's Jesus or not, that the Christ is a king. He's the son of David. He's not God. He's not divine. He's not the son of God. That, by the way, is still the official Jewish belief on God. Today, if you ask your Jewish friend, what do you think of the Messiah? He's not here yet, as they claim or as they teach. 
uh, what do you think of the Messiah when he comes? They would say he's a king that will rule from Jerusalem. He's not God. Even though the Bible says over and over and over again in the Torah that the Christ is divine. Later on, we read in Acts chapter 15 that those Pharisees believed. Believed in what? They did not really become Christians. They taught a false doctrine that you need to keep the law of Moses to be saved. Paul just came back from his first missionary journey. He said, this is ridiculous. I've been teaching people that you are saved by uh, grace through faith in Christ, not by the law. They said, you don't know nothing about the Christian faith. You're not even an apostle. That's why Paul sounds defensive in letters like Galatians and 2 Corinthians. These people, the Pharisees who believed, we call them today the Judaizers, taught that the Christ, I'm sorry, that Jesus is the Christ, but he's not the Son of God. They taught that you needed to keep the law to be saved, and they denied the apostleship of Paul. This is exactly what Islam teaches. So there is a historical and there is a theological background to the character of God and the Islamic faith. The, there are three parts to the answer to the question, is Allah God? I'm a preacher. I have, my brain has three parts. I think in groups of threes. So I have to come up with three points anyway. The first part, there is a linguistic part. By the way, if you ever want to preach the gospel to Muslims, or if you ever wanted to defend the Christian faith before your Muslim neighbor, uh, cordially and, 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 and in a nice way, you must know the full answer. And I will be talking about that in detail by the end of, of this class. There is a linguistic part to the answer. There is an anthropological part. And there is a theological part. Well, first of all, Allah is just an Arabic word that means God. By the way, the word Allah is used in the Arabic Bibles, the Arabic translations of the Bibles. God, believe it or not, does not have a driver's license that says, name God. God is just the English name of that one being, the creator of the universe, the king of kings, the father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I have no idea where my notes are. Oh, okay. These are the 10 most common languages in the world by country, not by native speakers. What's the most common language by native speakers in the world? Chinese. One out of every four people in the world speak Chinese. This is by country. The most common language is English. The English-speaking people, that is everybody here, we call God, God. The French people call him Dieu. That does not mean that there is another God that the French people worship. To say that God has a name in each of these languages except the third most spoken and the oldest among these languages is ridiculous. There are some other words in the Arabic translation of the Bible. By the way, the thing to the left is the Bible, not the Quran, even though it's written in Arabic. Some words that the, 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 the Bible uses in Arabic may sound alarming to the American ear. The Bible literally says in Arabic, in the beginning Allah created the heavens and the earth. It says in John 3, 16, for Allah so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, it says... In the book of Exodus, there is another word that may sound alarming to the American ear, the Sharia law. It is actually mentioned in the Bible, not the law of Islam, but the law of Moses is called Sharia. Uh, the Bible says in Exodus 24, 12, that God called Moses to come up on the mountain and he would give him the tablets of stone and the Sharia. Talking about the law of Moses as a, 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 a generic word. In Ephesians 5, 2, Paul says that we should walk in love as Christ also has loved us and submitted himself for us. Literally, the word submitted in the Arabic Bible is became Muslim. Did Christ convert to Islam? No, he did not. He submitted himself to us. This is my favorite. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, uh, 12 to fight the good jihad of faith. He's not telling him to fly planes into buildings. He just tells him to fight the Christian uh, 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 warfare, the spiritual warfare. By the way, funny story. A couple of years ago, I was contacted by a congregation near where I live in the Detroit area, and they wanted me to do a week-long version of my Islam in Christ's Eyes signature uh, lecture. And the man who called me, 
and like I got my calendar and we set the dates. Uh, he said, one more thing. Uh, what translation do you use? I said, why? I am a student of God's word. I use a lot of these. He said, well, my congregation is kind of conservative. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> How conservative? He said, they are kind of against the NIV. I said, well, my personal Bible is New King James. He said, then we are good. I said, you may want to tell your elders that my per native tongue Bible uses Allah for God, Sharia for the law of Moses, became Muslim to say that Christ submitted himself for us and to fight the good jihad. And just like that, the NIV sounded as conservative as the NRA. <laughs> Believe it or not, the Holy Spirit himself called God Allah and we read about that in the Bible. In Acts chapter 2, we read about the coming of the Holy Spirit in the day of Pentecost. The 12 apostles were sitting in one place. The Holy Spirit came upon them. They started doing a miracle of speaking in tongues. People were marveled that, gathered, that were gathering at Jerusalem. And they said in Acts 2, 7, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear in our, or uh, that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. And we usually skip the part that says Cretans, verse 11, and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of whom? God. The Holy Spirit was talking about God through the mouths of the apostles in Arabic. Guess what Arabic word uh, you were used for God 2,000 years ago? Easy. Make a time machine, travel 2,000 years to the past, and see and ask any Arab there. Or read the Arabic literature from that time and see what Arabs used. Uh, in fact, Arabic is a sister language of Hebrew, and Aramaic, the original languages of the Old Testament. And it is not too far away from the Hebrew word that is used in the Bible for God. Now, usually, the Bible uses the plural form of God, Elohim. And yet, we see in a few places like this one, Job 5.17, that the singular form of God, Eloh, which sounds an awful lot like the Arabic word, Allah, for God. Uh, if you remember the passion of Christ when Jim Caviezel, that's Jesus Christ, was nailed to the cross, he literally said in Aramaic, Elahi, Elahi, lima shabaktani. Literally, my Allah, my Allah, why have you forsaken me? That's the linguistic part. This is not the end of the answer to the question. Now, the anthropological part. Folks, Islam claims to be from God, but fails to prove it. Because here is the proof of the inspiration. The Bible says I'm from God. The Quran also says I'm from the same God who inspired the Bible. Okay, well, they have two kind of different messages. So at least one of them is not true. The Bible defines and offers the proof of its inspiration. The Bible welcomes you questioning his, or its inspiration and gives you, first of all, fulfilled prophecies. Deuteronomy 18, 21. If you say in your heart, how can I know the word which the Lord has not spoken? If the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and that does not come to pass, he has spoke, spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. A prophet prophesies, right? Does the Bible have any prophecies? A ton of them. Most of the Bible materials are prophecies. Most of them were fulfilled after they were foretold. Some of them are pending fulfillment. The Quran not only does not have any prophecies, Muhammad himself says he could not prophesy in the Quran. Chapter 7 and verse 188. I hope I will have the time to share a few of these notes in detail in our forum class. Oh, this is a mess. Uh, at, yeah, at, at 130. Uh, Muhammad says, if I had the knowledge of the unseen, I would have accumulated a lot of good things. Literally in the Quran. Basically, he just said, if I could prophesy, I would have gone to Las Vegas. 
Second of all, the public supernatural, those who preached God's word were empowered by the Holy Spirit doing miracles in public to confirm the prophetic word. Muhammad said he could not do any miracles in the Quran. Third, the harmony of the message. Any prophet that claims to be from God should bring a message that is in harmony with the rest of the revelations. Unlike that prophet in 1 Kings 13, the one that God sent to the northern kingdom of Israel to preach to the Israelite king Jeroboam and to go back a different way and, and, and not to spend the night there and not to eat or drink. He saw another prophet and he said, why don't you spend the night with me? He said, well, because God told me not to. He said, oh, I'm a prophet too. It's okay, you can stay with me. And the Bible says that he was killed because he suspected what God told him based on what somebody else told him. Yes, he was a prophet. The, uh, the Bible calls him a prophet. But his uh, revelation was not in harmony with the other revelation of God. And definitely the Quran's revelation is not in harmony. And so the Quran says I'm from God but fails to prove it. Okay, forget God now. Get God out of the picture and see study anthropologically, which is the study of humans apart from God humans culture and history and language and see how that God looks like in Islam the second part of the answer to the question is Allah God is also yes anthropologically the Quranic Allah is based on and inspired by the biblical God Muslims the Quran says that Muslims should worship the Christian God the Quran says that in chapter 4 verse 163 surely we this is supposedly God talking about himself have revealed to you, that's Muhammad, as we have revealed to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob. The Quran says that Muslims should worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Quran also says that Christians are worshiping the God of Islam. It says that in chapter 5 and verse 69, surely those who believe, that's Muslims, and those who are Jews, and the Sabians, that's a very small religion that is in Iraq. And the Christians, whoever believes in Allah. And by the way, it is a mistake to consider the Quran as one unit when you study the Quran. Because the Quran says it is one, not one unit. When you study the Bible, this is one uh, consistent uh, uh, word of God that, that claims to be an inspired word of God. The Quran says that it changes and that every later revelation supersedes or abrogate the previous revelation. So that passage in the Quran was abrogated by a later passage that Muhammad delivered that said, no, you cannot be a Christian and go to heaven. Christians and Jews are not fellow believers anymore. Islam went through three distinct phases. The first phase was from the time Muhammad claimed to be a prophet uh, for a whole decade. Uh, he did not introduce a new religion. He simply called the pagan Arabs to submit to the one God of the Bible. Did not introduce any new system, new uh, prayer and fasting uh, practices. A decade later, when Muhammad delivered chapter 6 in the Quran, which is the 55th surah chronologically, he introduced a new kosher law that is different than the Jewish kosher law, marking his first departure from the biblical pattern, introducing Islam as a separate religion, still tolerant to the rest of the Abrahamic faiths. And the difference was camels. That was the first time Muhammad says, Jews have this law, for the past decade, he was preaching the, 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 the Jewish law, the law of Moses. That was the first time he said, Jews have received this law. This is the Quran, by the way. You can read about that in my book. <laughs> but I say this, and the difference was camels. Camels are not kosher in the Jewish law. They are kosher in the Islamic law. Islam was still tolerant to the rest of the Abrahamic faith until the next stage started, the third phase, which is after the Hijrah or the migration of Muhammad from Mecca to Medina, that's when he introduced Islam as the only way to God and started waging war against anyone who does not convert to Islam. In each of those 
phases or stages, Muhammad delivered different Quran passages that are shuffled today in the Quran and the standard Quran the way you would shuffle a pack of playing cards. That's why the Quran is inconsistent. The Quran gives you a roadmap on how to understand that inconsistency if you study it in a chronological order. So the Quran here says, okay, Jews, good Christians, uh, 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 Muslims, we all worship the same God. We are all fine. Later on, the Quran changed its mind. The Quran says that Muslims and Christians are worshiping the same God in chapter 29, verse 46. Say to the people of the book, that's the Bible, our God and your God is one. Uh, a, a close study of the description of the character of God in the Quran reveals that he's the one God, that he's the one that created the heavens and the earth in six days, and that he's the one who created Adam out of dirt. He's the main character in the story of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah on the flood, Moses, and all these stories that we know in, in, in the Bible are quoted in the Quran. He was the one who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. The third part is the theological part, and that's the, the, the tricky part. Theologically, the God of the Quran, not that it's a different character, it's another being or an idol, but whatever the Quran says about God is not the same as the biblical God, because it does not theologically match that God. Here is why that part is serious. John says in his first letter, chapter 2 and verse 23. This is 1 John 2, 23. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. The Quran says that God does not have a Son. That is a very serious difference. John says... If you don't believe in the Son, you are not believing in the Father in the first place. Now, guess what John was talking about? Not Muslims, because Islam was officially born seven centuries after John. He was talking about the Jews. Jews don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, two things. Jews don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. They don't believe that the Christ is the Son of God either. And that's what was in John's mind at the beginning. Now, does that mean that they're worshiping a different God? This is very tricky. Please, folks, don't use that for narrow, foolish, political reasons to raise hatred against your Muslim neighbors. Because even though the Bible says that if you don't believe in Jesus as the Son of God, then you don't believe in God in the first place, Paul says in Romans 10 that he has a zeal for his fellow countrymen, that's the Jews, for, I'm sorry, that... Uh, his desire was for his fellow countrymen to be saved, for he bears them witness that they have a zeal for whom? For God, although zeal that is not according to knowledge. That actually is the case with my family. My mom loves God. My father loves God. My, all my relatives, they love God. But not a love that is out of knowledge, which is not a saving love in the first place. So it's a yes and no. But... Theologically, you cannot say that the Quranic description of God is the same as the biblical description. Um, one of the shortest surahs in the Quran, and hence one of the first surahs that we memorized when we were children, is that Allah neither begot anyone, nor was he begotten. Uh, the other difference in the character of God, uh, Allah uh, than that of uh, God of the Bible uh, is that God is more controlling the Islamic, I'm sorry, the Islamic God, that's Allah, is more controlling than the biblical God. Now, by the way, I know this is college, so you are more educated, which means you are, in a sense, more liberal. <laughs> I'm going to rinse my mouth after I said that, if somebody was offended, I'm sorry. But a few years ago, I made that exact same presentation in a church that had people that loved God so much, but it was a church in a very rural place. And they, probably I was the first non-white person that they ever saw. And so they were very, uh, like, uh, speculative uh, on me. So I made a statement that caused somebody to be angry and to leave the congregation. Now that person apologized to me after that. I'm, everything is fine now. I made the statement saying that the Quranic God is bigger than the biblical God. Well, he did not understand why I said that statement. And he did not want to hear any further, so he left and he did not finish the class. Here is what I meant. 
The Bible says that God died for your sins. The Quran says, no, that's blasphemy. God does not die. The Bible says that God rested on the seventh day. Oh, that's blasphemy. Did he get tired? The Bible says God feels sorry and weeps and cries and is compassionate. No, God is, God is bigger than that. By the way, if you... God is not whatever you decide about God. God is whatever he says about himself. And so that does not mean that the Quranic God is actually a real being that is bigger than the biblical God that you've been worshiping for decades. Or a decade and a half, depending on... on, on. <laughs> it just means that the Quran makes up that God that is way bigger than, than, than what Muslims believe the biblical God is. And how, big, how, how far can you go with this philosophical... Uh, 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 sophism. Can God create a rock that's bigger than him? So bigger than him that he cannot lift. If you say yes, then he's not God because the rock would be bigger than him. If you say no, then he's not God because he could not do something. And so folks, don't go on philosophical waste of time. Just read what the Bible says about God. The Quran, the Bible says that it was Adam who came up with the names for things. That was, by the way, the first thing, uh, time, one of the first times when I started to question Islam. I was a child when I read this in the Quran, and I said, okay, God taught Adam the names of everything, like did he teach him the name of the television? And in what language? In all languages? That does not make any sense. Well, the Bible makes more sense here when it says that it was Adam who came up with all these names. Uh, the Quranic God is not an absolutely loving God. He only loves the righteous people and not the disbelievers. That's the third passage. The uh, Quranic God's will, okay, the biblical God's will is not for anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. This is not the Quranic God's will that wants to fill hell first. And finally, the great commission of Islam is to fight until the world converts to Islam. This is the great commission. And somebody would say, open this Bible, and they would say, see, all Muslims are meeting in a secret dark room, and they want to convert the world to Islam. I have a few issues with this statement. To use this part of the Quran to say that all Muslims are a threat. By the way, Islam pretty much did not exceed its boundaries one century after the death of Muhammad. When Muhammad died in 632 AD, those who sat at the feet of Muhammad, his apostles, if you will, took Islam in conquests. My forefathers invaded Iraq 1400 years ago uh, in 636 uh, AD and, and, and they, uh, they, they displaced the natives and we gave them reservations and, and we've been staying there ever since. Uh, another person invaded Syria a year later. Another person, Jerusalem, a year later. And an exact century after the death of Muhammad in 732, Muslims fought their final battle with the uh, Franks, and they were defeated by the Franks led by Charles Martel, the, gra the grandfather of Charlemagne, the first holy emperor uh, at the Battle of Tours. Islam did not expand much after that, which happened 13 centuries ago. Trust me, it's not going to happen in your lifetime. Is Allah God? Well, yes, Allah is an Arabic word for God. So remember, if you ever plan to give any Bible to anyone, by the way, my school's president said that there was a certain congregation that supported a missionary that was printing and distributing Bibles in a Muslim country. And the congregation invited that missionary to talk about his work one time, and they said, what words are you using for God? He said, Allah. They discontinued his support and terminated the ministry. You will have to know that that's just a word. And well, so the, the theological part is uh, uh, Allah, if, okay, if you say Allah, you're either an Arabic speaking person that talks about God. And by the way, when I pray, I pray in my native tongue. Guess what I pray for? Or whom do I pray for? But when you are an English speaking person, when you say Allah, you usually use the word not as a word for God, but as a term to describe the Quranic God as opposed to the biblical God. And so in that sense, no. Why it is important? Know the linguistic part uh, to know what's being communicating to the Arab speaking people, especially those Muslims.
If you give them Bible, you have told them that, that Allah is God. Why do you have to know the anthropological part? You wouldn't tell your Muslim neighbor, I am get, uh, introducing a new God to you, any more than you would tell your Jewish neighbor that. Because they both don't believe in the divinity of Christ and in the fathership of, of God. And so, uh, you don't introduce a new God, you redefine God to them in spirit and in truth, as the Bible says, and not as the Quran says. No, because you cannot say that Muslims are worshiping God really if they don't know who uh, 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 God uh, is. I think this is the conclusion of, uh, it's either the conclusion or this thing is stuck. And so I will assume it was the conclusion of this uh, morning's class. I'm so looking forward to see you at 1.30 uh, at the LC building, wherever that is. And thank you so much. And God bless you. If he only had some passion about him, <laughs> that's what you're going to get this afternoon if you come to students, if you come to the student forum. That's what you will hear tonight if you come for the keynote. And uh, I've been blown away by what he has done this morning. The books that he mentioned, he actually wrote two books, Islam Through Christ's Eyes and then I Am Christian and I Am an Arab. I'm an Arab, I'm a Christian. Uh, both of them are in the lobby of the uh, Harris Parker building, available for you to purchase, and I've read both of those books. They're outstanding, and I highly recommend them to you. Uh, quickly, we have several things this morning, this afternoon. The Forum on Instrumental Music will be in Lester Chapel. That's LC, by the way. <laughs> Lester Chapel over here at the Harris building. Uh, and then... There's also the, uh, the students that will be conducting the second floor lecture there in the uh, Curley Library at that same hour. 1.30 to 4, Wissam will be giving a student forum. And again, you'll want to come to that. 4.30, the Faulkner Family Fellowship at the fellowship room here in the uh, University Church Building. And then tonight at 7 o'clock following the congregational singing at 6.15, Wissam will be speaking on the subject, God is near again a full day and i hope that you'll take advantage of all of it please stand and we'll be dismissed in prayer let us pray our god and our father hallowed be your most holy and reverend name father i thank you that you have and continue to bless us so far beyond what we deserve Thank you for life, and thank you for the privilege of spending that life as your child and to know that one day we can be with you forever. Father, I thank you for the school here at Faulkner, for the good that it has done for so many, for so many years, and pray that you'd continue to bless it and the work that they're doing. Thank you for this good lectureship and the benefits that we receive from it. Thank you for the speakers that we've heard and Pray your blessings upon the ones that we'll hear through the remainder of the lectureship. Father, I thank you for our brethren, for the encouragement and the help that we give one another, and for the opportunities like this to be together and to receive that encouragement and that faith that we get from being here. Father, thank you and continue to be with us. Thank you most of all for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen.